We now have another 15 minutes or so in which we can carry on the conversation and invite uh, some audience participation. We are done with the television part of the uh, debate, so we can still uh, carry on the conversation and invite some questions from, uh, from the floor. So I'll just let a few of the folks uh, just settle down here and uh, then we can start the q and I think we have went a little bit over, so we have about uh, 10 or 15 minutes. And I think we have uh, some colleagues in the audience with uh, roving mics as well. I'll just uh, wait for everyone to settle down first of all. <laughs> right. Shall we begin? Who would like to? Get the ball rolling. Yes, sir, if you can, uh, can we have a mic for the gentleman here right at the front of the audience? And so if you could be good enough to say uh, who you are and where you're from, please. Uh, Rami Sharaf, Senior Vice President of the Royal Group in Cambodia. Uh, I want to comment on the connectivity, the digital connectivity, and offering uh, faster and cheaper uh, uh, digital connectivity to be the solid platform to build on the fourth revolution that we are talking about. Uh, I want to welcome everyone in Cambodia and I want to share uh, one example of that connectivity that connected Cambodia, Malaysia and Thailand. And this is an initiative that was done by a local company in Cambodia called Royal Group connecting the first submarine fiber optic connection and this was done on 15th March with, a, with an investment of $100 million. So this Cambodia, the, the, the uh, developing uh, sister among the big family of ASEAN, uh, uh, did it. And that was a great example to come to uh, uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Giorgio mentioned about how can we get no roaming, no, 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 no charges, and get into that uh, actual uh, accessibility. So this is just, just a comment. The other comment is our role as business leaders, and here we have 600, 700, and I think one major uh, uh, point is how proactive is the private sector in ASEAN? Many will think, well, you know, governments are not doing a good job. Well, we should take the lead and we should come to the governments with what we believe as ambitious, what we believe as feasible, what we believe as the coming steps to build this solid, strong uh, body called, called ASEAN, which should be operational. So once we come to that point of being proactive, governments will surely uh, uh, react and we know that in, in, in countries like Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, the governments couldn't, couldn't stand still when we had these proactive, uh, this proactive private sector. They came with better regulation, they came with uh, certain processes, they needed to invest in, in basic infrastructure, in education, human capital. So all these uh, pillars to build that ideal model should come from us as proactive private sector. Your thoughts, please. So, uh, look, look, I think you're right. And I can tell you from our perspective, we are a regular, we have, as I mentioned before, 9,000 people in the ASEAN region. We have regular senior level contact with every government in the ASEAN region to talk about things that we can do and they can do to facilitate the development of infrastructure projects. So I think, to me, that's what comes with a bilateral world, right? We can't, can't wait for yeah. TPP. We, we have to go door to door. And what allows us to be successful is engaging with these governments to understand what their agenda is and how we can marry that with our agenda. And, and that's the nature of, of of the 21st century in a bilateral world for a company like GE. And we can't, we will not stop that. Even if TPP was reconstituted tomorrow, we will still build a strategy around 
a bilateral approach because what Indonesia needs is a little bit different than what Cambodia needs, and that's a little different than what the Philippines needs. I guess I look at it, the, the, uh, the three components, right? You know, everything we do, there's one component, you, there's nothing, it's beyond your control. There's nothing much you can do, you don't spend time on that. There's another component of uh, things that you can't, don't have much control, especially with regards to like TPP or the government actions or policies and all that, but we can, we can have influence. So we spend our efforts advocating like what I'm trying to do on the broadband, trying to advocate and come up with a proposal. But in reality, as I, you kind of you alluded to, a big chunk of the things that we can do something ourselves, the private sector should take the initiative. So for us, for example, um, yeah, we need help from Spectrum, we need help on many other regulations with regards to broadband and so on. We decided to say, okay, we're going to spend, uh, like this year, we're going to spend to the tune of 6.5 billion or what is that, uh, close to 2 billion, 1.7, 1.6 billion US dollar to roll out primarily broadband. We, we, to, help, to help the digital entrepreneurs, uh, we need help, but we decided that, okay, while we, we can't solve the whole world's problem or ASEAN problem, we decided to invest in Malaysia to the tune of about, you know, uh, we build a fund together with our partners, uh, about 20, 25 million US dollar fund to fund the digital entrepreneurs uh, in Malaysia. And recently, about a few weeks ago, we, small fund, in the scheme of things, it's very small, but it's a good start. We, we put in five million dollar US, to help small little companies in Cambodia to jumpstart their digital, all these digital entrepreneurs. And I can go on and on, but you're right, absolutely. We can't wait for the whole world to help us. We've got to do it ourselves. George. Although most tariffs have been zero uh, in ASEAN, non-tariff measures uh, remain a big problem. And some tell me that it's getting worse. Crossing borders uh, is not always easy in Southeast Asia. But with highways, with better connectivity, and with more and more multinationals coming to ASEAN, they have a lot of influence in ensuring that the procedures for crossing border are properly codified and regularized. Local players will always find it difficult, say in agricultural products, but multinationals here can play a big role. And they have access to ministers. Wherever they, whichever country they visit in Southeast Asia. John, I'm just really curious because you use the example, and it's a great example of Myanmar five or six years ago, zero G connectivity. Yeah. Now you have 4G, if I'm not mistaken. So, what drove that impetus? Did it come from government saying, let's just do it, let's make some progress here with conviction, or was it business pushing it? Who, who was the leading agency here? Right. I think it's, a, I think it's both. Yeah. I mean, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen unless the government makes it a priority. I think it's a, it's a good example of pretty far-sighted, you know, effort on behalf of the new, at the time, government in Myanmar, and then, and then companies that lined up to support it. Yeah. So I think it's, it exactly illustrates the point that, that, I, that, I, that, I, that I mentioned before, and you need that because, because there has to be private investment to make it work. It's not going to be funded completely by the government, but the investors need to know that the government is behind this strategy and it's an important priority for the government. Thank you, sir, for that question. Uh, let's take one more at the back here. Yes, sir. I'm Ian Grundy from the ADECO Group. I had a question for John. John, you talked about technology and the fourth industrial revolution and how that will change jobs. And that all jobs are gonna change at some point in the future. And obviously, I think all of us agree with that. In an organization the size of GE, one of the world's largest employers, how do you do that talent planning? How do you look at the different parts of the business, think about what's gonna be needed in 10, 15 years from now? Well, we, it, you know, we probably spend a billion dollars a year on training, but we've also realized over the last 10 years that we have to train our own people differently. You know, you know I grew up in a world where vertical skills were more important than horizontal skills. You know, you, you, I was in finance and I was taught to stay in my swim lane and swim fast and touch the wall first and I would be rewarded with a promotion and more salary and it was a very vertical, siloed world because it was slower 
and, and that worked. In today's world, you can't have leaders that operate like that because, mm -hmm. because your horizontal skills and ability to cut across an organization matter as much as your vertical or your domain competence. And I'd argue for governments, because governments, you know, including the United States and Western Europe, notoriously siloed, suboptimal in performance, I think, as a result of that. This, this idea that you have to train for a different type of leadership in the 21st century is, is permeating GE. And we're still figuring out how to do that. But reskilling and retraining and teaching people to adapt to what I, that's a point I made before, is, is the focus of our training efforts, not imparting a, ver a specific skill, right? Which is what we tried to do 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Do we have any more questions? I feel a little bit like a deer in the headlight because I can't quite see <laughs> people over here. Back, but so. yes, there's a gentleman who has a question here. Yes, sir, please. Right to the front, please. Yes. Good morning. My name is Wong Se Misot. I'm a secretary of state for Ministry of Economy and Finance. I believe most of you have business in Cambodia. But before you leave this session, I would like to seek your advice on Cambodia's future directions. What you would say, the most urgent thing to do for Cambodia in the next three years to be successful? <laughs> First of all, did everyone hear the question correctly? No, what was the question? Right, if I'm not mistaken, sir, what's the most urgent priority for this country, for Cambodia, in the next three years? Yes, that's the question. Um, Greta, do you want to take that one first? Then we'll go around the panel and we'll have to make that the, the last one, I'm afraid, because we'll be crashing into the other session. So my approach would, of course, be uh, how do we develop sustainable solutions regarding the core areas ranging from energy needs to uh, education, and uh, build from, from there, actually, how do you secure building the national capacity? But the overall um, political priorities would, of course, have to be set nationally. And as a UN official, I would not dare to go into that space. Jamal. <laughs> well, Spoken like a diplomat, <laughs> but I share the sensitivity. Jamal, please. For, for me, it sounds like broken record. It sounds like I'm a hammer. Look, everything looks like nails to me. But certainly, not the only, but uh, back to broadband, I think uh, Cambodia can benefit tremendously and can leapfrog as a country. Um, the mobile industry, in fact, is growing faster than most of the neighboring countries in ASEAN. And broadband, of course, is very low penetration. When I say broadband, fixed and fixed wireless broadband, that can be accelerated. And the digital economy that goes along with it, that sits on top of that, can be accelerated. So I think that should be the priority. And that should be the competitive angle that Cambodia as a country can differentiate within ASEAN and, of course, with, uh, outside ASEAN. You know, the infrastructure challenges that remain in Cambodia require foreign capital to be solved. Uh, the best way to attract foreign capital is to give investors visibility, and that visibility has to be over a number of years. Ch China, you know, taught us all with the development of five-year plans that actually mean something and allow you to line up under a, a set of priorities, and, and if you work hard, you can be successful. So, so I'd suggest have a plan, publicize the plan, and stick with the plan so that you can attract the capital to build out the broadband infrastructure to develop power generation where it needs to be developed, build out health care where it needs to be built out. You need, you need a combination of public and private efforts, and a long-term, more visible plan will help you get those external investors. Uh, Minister, two, two days ago, I visited Sihanoukville. Uh, it was my first visit there. I saw the port which was uh, built with assistance from Japan. I saw the Chinese Special Economic Zone, which is about 10 square kilometers, and two, three hundred factories already operating. 
and the plans for the future are exciting. You have now, in the next two, three years, an opportunity to avail yourself of enormous assistance from China, Japan, and other countries to help develop your infrastructure. Don't miss this tide. It will not flow forever. So in the coming years, when this is flowing, ride it as much as you can. Internally, you are a country reborn. And you have so many young people. And we met many of them yesterday at the open forum. Education is a key. And if we must scream on everything else, invest in education, because that is your future. Ladies and gentlemen, on that note, we will uh, end the session there. We hope you found it as uh, useful and informative uh, as I have. I've learned a lot, certainly, from all our panelists. Let's just give them a round of applause one last time. But for Remo, Benaludin Ibrahim, John Rice of GE, and uh, Giorgio. And thank you for your participation. Thank you very much.